And uh, it's good evening to a man who has spent more than a few hours with that particular band, Michael Chug. Hi, Hi Robbie. How are you, mate? I'm oh, very well. Uh, author of Hey You in the Black T-shirt, which uh, takes a look at the life of, uh, of Chuggy, as he's known in the industry. He's been a, uh, well, somebody closely involved in the music industry as a promoter, uh, I guess a, a stirrer, <laughs> <laughs> amongst other things, for what, well, over, over 40 years? Yeah, it's actually um, 48 years. That's amazing, isn't it? Mm. Uh, we were just having a little conversation there that, uh, he, he, while that was playing, that uh, here you are on the interview circuit, if you like, probably feeling uh, a bit like a lot of those artists that uh, you would have been involved with over the years doing the... Uh, the, the well, I now know why they used to bitch and moan about <laughs> doing uh, interviews on show day. I mean, I'm totally washed out. It's incredible. Oh, yeah. Well, it will go easy on you. But let, no, let's, let's, the, book, the book starts with that band, mm, um, yeah. with, with Fleetwood Mac. How did you first get involved with... Uh, here they are, one of the biggest bands in, in the 70s. Mm. Um, I was... Um, in the 70s, I uh, got offered uh, uh, a, a tour by uh, a guy called Ron Blackmore, um, who was working with Paul Dainey. Uh, I got offered a tour, a status quo tour in the early 70s, and I did that, and Dainey was so pleased with it that he offered me more work. And, mm. By the time Fleetwood and Mac came around, I, uh, Ron Blackmore had moved on. He started a big sound company, and uh, I was actually Dainty's freelance tour director for most of the 70s. And uh, Paul uh, came back from San Francisco, and he had this idea to do Rock Arena based around the big shows that Bill Graham used to do in San Francisco at the time called Day on the Green and uh, Fleetwood Mac and Santana and we put Little River and Kevin Boric who I was managing mm. at the timeline and that's how it all started. Well when you signed up uh, Fleetwood Mac you probably didn't realise w- quite what their specific requirements were going to be and it, it, it is a nice insight <laughs> into the world of rock and roll and the excess of uh, of rock and roll as it uh, yeah. as it plays out, isn't it? What 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 would the what we call the rider the the things that the band requests must be there backstage. Catering rider, it's called. Yeah, I've never heard cocaine called a catering rider before, but, <laughs> but it was there, wasn't it? Yeah, it was quite amazing, really, because um, n- no one I knew in in seventy six, seventy seven had ever seen it. You know, it was we were. We were pot smokers. Mm. So nobody seen cocaine in Australia? No, well, we certainly hadn't. It wasn't, it wasn't what it became. Uh, but they were a monstrous, huge band, and the figures they were doing all over the world was incredible. And uh, when they arrived here, it was like a whirlwind, you know. There was the band, and then each of the band members had about four people looking after them, and then there was a hundred-odd roadies and uh, containers full of... You know, one container had two grand pianos in it, a mobile gym and two bicycles. It was never unpacked. And the rider was, you know, totally over the top. And um, backstage they wanted a medieval tent um, with all the bunting. and. So did you get these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah got it all. They wanted Gatorade, which we had to import. They wanted... Uh, uh, limes at every show, so I smuggled limes around Australia and uh, <laughs> and Heineken beer, which was really expensive and hard to get. And they also wanted two ounces of cocaine. And you know, um, I just want to say, I mean, you know, I'm not blowing the whistle on Fleetwood Mac. It's very no, common it, knowledge that it's it's it, uh, it's certainly been revealed yeah, well before this very point in time. Knowledge that they toured the world, but they on. they obviously had quite a cocaine problem, didn't they? They did, and yeah. it became a bigger problem as as time went on. But mm. it was out of control, and I mean, you know, I don't know whether the stuff we got them was real cocaine or just mm. vitamin B crushed up. But mm. certainly, uh, as the tour went on. Um, the real thing arrived and mm. it was, uh, you know, and to be part of it, you had to participate or they didn't want you on the tour. So, so you know, it's, it's my story is an interesting story, but it's nothing uh, new. You uh, know. How do you feel, though, going into writing a book like this, writing your memoirs, you're dealing with a lot of, you know, personal information, aren't you, from, yeah. from people. So when you go into the, the prospect of writing a book like this, how do you how do you treat it? For you, it would have been easier not to have included that story. Yeah, but it was okay to include that story because no one's going to sue me because it's it's written in folklore and uh, 
you know, there's a lot of stories I could have included that wouldn't have been the right thing to do. And, um, you know, there's references to Bon Jovi's Lost Weekend in Port Douglas. Well, it's n I'm not going to be the one to blow the whistle. Uh, the reason we there's reference in it, the, their security guy wrote about it. But, um, you know, I just we just tried to capture some moments mm. and, you know, what effect it had on me going forward. Um, let, 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 let's go back to the early days because you, you started out for, at a very early age. I was going to use the word hustling and that, that's, that's not the right word to use because that suggests maybe something a little more underhand. But, but you, were, you were always motivated about getting things done, getting a business going, weren't you? And it, and it started out what, at cycling track? Yeah, I, basically, um, you know, I grew up surrounded by great music and through various reasons. And then I heard the Beatles and uh, I was 15 at the time and the cycling club were doing a charity month and I, be, I was working part-time in a furniture shop and I knew a local bass player who actually went on to become a member of the Mixtures years later. But... Um, and I asked, I suggested to the cycling club that we run a dance. And so how old were you? Fifteen. Fifteen. Mm. And we ran this dance at the Launceston Traders Hall. We got about 350 people and made 80 pounds for the cycling club, which in those days was a, a lot of money. Mm. I mean, we used to charge, you know, after that I started managing one of the bands we had on the bill and we'd mm. run dances in church halls and it was five shillings but to get in. But was it that first moment? Do you, do you think, is it, is it like a gambler who gets, the, who does the, the first bet and it pays off? Is, is it that, was it that moment that you got the bug? Well, um, yeah, yeah, it was because I saw 350 people having their time of, the li time of their lives and I'd created it and I thought, well, you know, and I just, got, I got such a buzz out of it. I got a buzz out of designing the press ads. I got a buzz out of to going to the radio station and convincing them to give us some advertising. It was just a great buzz. And, mm. and you know, then I started managing a young band and we started playing church halls and then we went to Hobart and Launces and mm. Devonport and well, well, started touring. Well, uh, a lot of your experience was gained in the, uh, in the 70s and a lot of the advances that you made in your career were in the 70s. What sort of place was Australia like? back then for a promoter what what were the what, what was the uh, the behavior if you like for uh, for promoters how did you go about it well um you know i i didn't really i was promoting local shows and um i took a tazzy band to melbourne and i got involved with michael Gunnisky and michael browning in an agency called consolidated rock and basically i was more or less tour managing and and running shows for them and doing that and um, the first promoting I did was basically the second Gary Glitter tour. Mm. Um, and it went from there. It, Australia was a long, long way away from the rest of the world. We, we, it was a brand new thing. Um, there was Ken Brodziak and Harry and Miller bringing out acts. The big international acts, Paul Dainty turned up with Roy Orbison here, went home to England, packed his bags and came back and started to, and that's when it really started. But, but how tough was it for you? I mean, it, it, Australia is a long way from the rest of the world even now and here we have the age of the internet and, and cheap airfares. Back in the 70s, I take it, it was... Oh, it was incredible, um, you know. It, the, the, but it was also different in such that the act... These days, the act takes 95% of the profit if you're lucky. And in those days, they got paid flat fees. So, you know, uh, the potential was there to make a lot of money. But to get the acts to come was, was you know, Dainty was very st good at doing that. I mean, um, and uh, it was a tough thing. And so, so how do you go? Do you, you court them? Do you go over there and, oh, yeah, and well, so you personally meet yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've just done a trip now where I've been and seen some new shows and been to go and see Roger Waters do the wall in Toronto. And you do. You spend time over there. I've, in the last 25 years, I've tried to create the illusion that I actually live in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> and, yeah, time goes so fast these days that you, I could see you today and then see you again in seven weeks and you and I would think we might have seen each other two weeks ago. <laughs> so I've created that illusion. Yeah. 
But it was tough in those days. There was no sound equipment in the country. There was no lighting equipment in the country. Um, we were all still learning how to do things. There were no outdoor stages. There were no yeah. roofs. The first real roof arrived with ABBA in 1975. Well, let's talk about that. When Michael Chug is with me tonight. He's the, uh, well, promoter and somebody who's been around the music industry for nearly 50 years. Hey You in the Black T-shirt is, uh, is the book that lays down his stories, his, em- his memoirs. ABBA once again, one of the biggest bands in the world and they tour Australia and they arrive it was the Sydney concert, wasn't it? Tell us what happens Well, we went to the airport to meet them and uh, all these people got off the plane in beautiful white jackets it was it was like a visiting football team and they had uh, this amazing road crew, uh, young English guys who've all gone on to become major players in the production side of our business and um, it was quite incredible. They bought the roof with them. They bought the staging. They bought the sound. And the staging was, um, you know, they, this is the first time we'd ever had hydraulics in them mm. to get the orchestra up and down. And so, so you had an orchestra. You were supposed to have an orchestra on stage, mm. ABBA themselves, a hydraulic stage, and an inflatable roof, wasn't it? Mm, it yeah. was. Yeah. And um, we set up, we built the stage, set up, got ready for the concert in rain. For the entire week. It so rain is the enemy of the promoter. It rained on us all week and, uh, you know, the stage had white flooring, the roof was white, everything was white. So, you know, uh, the first night of the first show, we took 250 white towels from the Siebel Townhouse to keep the... <laughs> from the hotel? Yeah. So you, you turn up to, the, uh, t- to the, the event, there's thousands of people there ready to see ABBA and it's pouring with rain. At what it actually uh, fined up that afternoon... Um, uh, and um, it, the first show, it actually, we got away with it. And we went, everybody was so exhausted. Uh, and it, the show was triumphant. Everybody was so exhausted that um, we went back to the hotel and we had this amazing party downstairs in the Siebel Townhouse Ballroom. And uh, it went on for hours. And unbeknownst to us, the skies had opened up again. And... Um, and at about six o'clock in the morning, uh, I got a phone call from the security guy at the venue. He said, I think you guys better come out here. So I woke Eric Robinson and we were massively hung over and we go out to the showgrounds and the sun's shining. But here's 25,000 seats floating in the showground. And the roof, what had happened is the roof had filled up with water and it was about that far off the stage. Oh, so a few, few feet off the stage. It was yeah. like, a, like a tent when, yeah, when, when a tent a gets big, waterlogged. Yeah, and a big dip in the middle and fortunately uh, the security guy, his dog had started barking during the night and he walked outside and saw what was happening. So he turned the power off and then he rang us and we turned up there and uh, fortunately the showground was very good at drainage and we were able to um, <laughs> reseat everybody and um, uh, we went on with the show. And did this, did this actually make it into the ABBA movie? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah it did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I made it into the ABBA movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm the voiceover at the start saying, welcome to ABBA, stop running. <laughs> yeah, so... That, so you've, you've got your place in history, Chuggy. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. <laughs> and then we got to Melbourne and uh, we did. We arrived in Melbourne on Moomba Day and uh, the, the ABBA had to go to the town hall for a you know, mm. wave off the balcony and it was the biggest crowd they'd ever had in the city and... Um, we had to get the band to the town hall and the uh, the uh, crew and the band, uh, the yeah. backing players down yeah. to the My Music Bowl and logistically it was it was an incredible tour because we'd never seen mm. hysteria like that since the Beatles. But the thing about this was the hysteria was coming from mums and dads and five to ten year old kids. Not just sixteen year old girls. No, that's well, they were there too. But. But-